Welcome everyone to our virtual chat for the celebration of women and girls in astronomy. Hello, I am Lucinda Offer, Education and Outreach Events Officer at the Royal Astronomical Society, which encourages the study of astronomy, geophysics, and space science. This year, the RAS is delighted to take part in the IAU celebration of women and girls in astronomy with this live stream of 30 minute chats, highlighting some of our amazing RAS William, women fellows. And just to let you know, we have had numerous great talks on women astronomers by doctors Mandy Bailey and Helen Cluse, who did the women of the RAS and women and the stars. You can find those on our YouTube channel. We also have a three day live stream from the University of Leicester, a PhD student, Emma Thomas, who allowed us to learn more about what astronomers do while we observed her collecting data about the aurora of Uranus from the infrared telescope facility atop Mauna Kea, Hawaii in the weird and wonderful world of Uranus. All can be found at the Royal Astronomical Society's YouTube channel. And we hope you will check it out after our chat with our current guest, who I am honored to introduce to you. Camille Lorfing is a second year PhD student working in solar and plasma physics at UCL's Mullard Space Science Laboratory, which is also called the Department of Space and Climate Physics. And there she studies solar electron beams and how they interact with the plasma of the solar wind and solar corona. And I'm going to allow Camille to tell us more in a bit but first, just a quick note to let you know that we will try to make time for a short Q&A at the end of today's chat. So please post any questions to the Q&A icon if you've joined us on Zoom. And thank you everyone for being here and thank you Camille for being with us. We're gonna get started. So when you have a moment, go ahead and turn on your camera. Hello, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Um, thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak um, this week and especially today. No, thank you for giving us your time and thank you for being interested and sharing your story with us because uh, you know, that's what the RAS wants to do is inspire uh, uh, people about a future career in astronomy and geophysics and space science and more so, you know, women and girls that are interested in these uh, topics as well. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience as a young girl and, and when and what got you inspired in science? Um, so I know that when I was a kid, my parents used to take me a lot to uh, a science museum in Paris, which is called the Palais de la Découverte. And um, so this place had lots of science experiments um, and plenty of cool things that you, you could do yourself. So um, you could participate in the experiments um, and things like that. And I would love going there. And I feel like in my memory, we would go every weekend. I feel like didn't happen that often, but I have great memories of that. Uh, and I feel like that's what got me got me interested. And then my parents got me a lot of books about science uh, and reading more and more about this um, got me interested in, uh, in space. And then when I was eight years old, uh, one of my teachers had a book about the first and only French female astronaut, Claudie Aignoret. And so I started reading more about her and I started wanting to become an astronaut. And then, um, we had to do a presentation the following year on like any important figure we liked. And I chose the first female to go to space. So Valentina Tereshkova. And then from there, I just, you know, started to become more and more passionate about all of this. So it started. Yes. When I was <laughs> Amazing. You had lots of um, really great role models. It sounds like when you were growing up and um, that is always good to hear. Uh, are those your mentors you think that you had or did you have any other rich experience, experiences or mentors that you'd like to give a mention? Um, well, obviously my parents because they've always um, supported me in all of this and in my choice of studies and today um, and in general. But uh, I guess the funny thing is I used to really hate physics um, until I was about 15 and um, my mom who is now listening, I, th I think she's probably laughing right now because they tried everything to get me to like physics. They brought engineer friends over to have dinner at home to convince me that physics was interesting. Um, and I just didn't want to study it and I, I hated it. And then the following year, I had a really, really great physics teacher. So I'd like to thank Mr. Zajac because he was the best physics teacher ever and he got me to love physics. And then that year I decided I wanted to study that. So. Um, it all took one good physics teacher to get me to light the topic, but before that, I would have never thought of going into that field. That's amazing. I mean, a teacher is, um, teachers are amazing, and um, I'm glad you had that teacher in your life. That is so important. As a, as a teacher myself since 2004, um, it's a, 
and I still teach GCSE astronomy at the RAS, uh, which we offer for free uh, as a two year astronomy course. But um, before that, I taught in, in the United States and here in the UK physics and astronomy. And I, I, it's a, amazing for the teachers too, to have students and especially students like you, who, um, who we can see a spark, you know, a change. What do you think your teacher did for you that kind of made the difference? I don't know, it's just, um, I just thought was, physics was boring. And then I guess he made us see that physics was everywhere around us um, and kind of start noticing little things. Um, and then I would see something like, oh, this is physics, and then this is physics as well, and then this is physics, and then being able to solve problems through physics, um, I guess, yeah, those are like the two things. But also he, he made physics fun, so um, he would always wear like these funny ties, and then he would always make like physics problems really like linked to everyday life or linked to funny things, and then, yeah, we'd, everyone used to enjoy physics classes with him, and so... Yeah, I guess when, when things are fun, then you learn better and faster and you're interested in what you, you're being taught. So what did you do after that? You know, what was, so this, what, what, when did you have this teacher? Was it primary, secondary? Uh, it was when I was 16. 16 years and old. And again, when I was eight, 18, yeah. Oh, so you had, did you have them twice or you had two yeah. different? I had wow, them. excellent. And it was, where was this in the world? Um, so that was in Paris because I was born and raised there. Um, so yeah, I went to the school in Paris. And... So what was your career path after that? So you had this kind of awakening that physics, and did you ever think back like all the efforts that your parents made? <laughs> but, and then what was your career path then? Where did you take it? Um, so I decided I wanted to study astrophysics. And in France, you can only that uh, during, you can only do that, sorry, during your second years of master's. You have to start by doing like normal physics. Um, and the UK offered physics with astrophysics from undergrad uh, already. So I decided to apply um, to come to the UK. And so I studied at the University of Manchester. I did an MPhys, so it's an integrated master's. So it's four years. You do three years bachelor's and years master's uh, in physics with astrophysics. Um, and yeah, so there, uh, everything was like, it was super interesting. I really, really enjoyed my degree there. Manchester is a fantastic uni to study physics um, and uh, or even to be a student in general. It's, um, I, I had such a nice time there. Um, and I remember that I took this plasmas module in third year um, and I was like, okay, this is what I wanted to do. Like plasmas is my favorite, um, my favorite topic. Uh, and then the following year I had this incredible lecturer called Philippa Browning. She works in plasma physics, but she was teaching physics of fluids. And yeah, like I decided I would, wanted to do that for my PhD. Um, so now I'm studying at UCL, so at the Mullert Spain um, Laboratory. But um, so yeah, that, that was what I did, but always, you know, physics. <laughs> Are those some of the highlights of Philippa Browning? She sounds like she was also an inspiration for you. And was she, was she, a, she was teaching there at university? Uh, yeah, 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 she, yeah. Yeah. And did you enjoy where, you know, not only just the university, it sounds like, but the university life in Manchester, do you think that made a difference for you? Uh, yeah, I think it did because Manchester is really good in, uh, in physics and like you could go talk to, to like lecturers in general or like just like knock on anyone's doors and ask them about their research or just go for pints with professors. Um, and yeah, there was, it was a way to like see that these people were normal and, they, you know, had like they were human, they had a life, they had like fun things or hobbies they would do um, outside of work and you can totally relate to them. They were not just these people who do physics. Um, and yeah, I also met people from loads of different departments and I have friends who studied very different things, not just physics, but um, it was great to be able to, you know, interact with all these people. Yeah. And what do you think about, um, you know, so your path, you're still in it. You're still a PhD student. How much longer? So your second year, does that mean you have two or three years to go? Um, so in total, it's three and a half years and my funding finishes on the 27th of March, 2024. So just okay. over two years left. Yeah. And so your career path so far, I mean, how does that, you know, you're at MSSL, which is an exciting place to be. Have you been there? For, so you've been there for two years so far. How is that going? Uh, yeah, so the first year of my PhD, I actually did it remotely with my parents um, in Paris because of COVID. But I've been back in London since September, and it's been it's been great to be able to interact with the rest of the lab, um, see people in person. I really love the solar and the plasmas group. I get along really well with the people, and I have three amazing supervisors um, who are always here if I have questions or um, 
I, yeah, I get to chat with them a lot and laugh a lot with, with everyone there. And Miss Sally's like a big family. It's very different from all the other departments, I guess, because when I speak to people, it doesn't seem like their departments are as wholesome as MSSL is. It's really like this little, you know, bubble. It's, it's great. Tell us a little bit about MSSL because, you know, people who might be listening might not know much about it, but it is separate from campus, right? And, and it is sort of a bubble because it's separate from campus and, um, you know, you mingle with those people there. You don't really get to see everybody at UCL because it's so far, but maybe tell us a little bit about that experience. Um, so yeah, MSSL is uh, the Department of Space and Climate Physics and it's actually based in Surrey. Um, so in Holmbury Hill, which is, I guess, a 25, 30 minute drive south of Guildford. It's in the middle of Surrey Hills and it's an old Victorian mansion in the middle of the forest. It's, um, it's quite a picturesque um, scenery and um, it's very it's very nice because people who go there are actually super passionate about what they do. If not, they wouldn't go all the way to the middle of Surrey um, to, to study space and climate physics. But um, so there's that. And yeah, it's just such a nice environment to work in. You're surrounded by nature. We always go for walks after lunch. Um, you, you can go out and just like work in the sun if you want. You can, um, yeah, you're just surrounded by nature. The view is absolutely amazing. And I think it's just, it's just such a great place to, to work. It's, yeah. It's so interesting because you're plasma physics. You're like, it's so great to work in the sun. So, <laughs> do you ever stop thinking about the sun? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so you're inside observing the sun, I imagine, any time of the day. Mm, yeah. A night. <laughs> Well, on the other side of the like Southern hemisphere, I guess, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, and out in the day, you can go out and work in the sun. That sounds lovely. Um, so, um, so what are you doing what you think you're doing or do you have, you know, ideas of where you're, this might take you when you finish and hopefully in 2024, fingers crossed. Um, and uh, you know, what do you have planned? Um, so I don't know yet if I want to continue in research and do a postdoc, that is definitely an option. Um, but I've always been super interested in working for the space industry. So um, either NASA or ESA. Um, so yeah, we'll see. I love space missions. I follow um, a lot what um, all the satellites that are being launched. Um, and I did participate last year actually in the UK SETS um, satellite design competition. So we were a team of students. It was both PhD students and undergrads from different disciplines. There were engineers um, and people studying physics and we were basically creating and building a satellite and all the, and everything that goes with the space mission uh, for an analog lunar mission. And we were evaluated by a panel of people in the industry and we had mentors uh, in the industry. So we were yeah, evaluated on the same criteria as they, uh, that they use for real missions. That was quite exciting. It lasted for about nine months. Um, and that kind of really got me more interested in working for the space industry. So that would be, you know, another option. You mentioned like, you know, you could potentially observe the, the sun. I imagine you're doing remote observation. You could do it. How many different telescopes do you, does MSSL says, I don't know, you know, maybe, and maybe some of our audience members don't. MSSL, do they have dedicated time on telescopes in the Northern hemisphere? Do they have any in the Southern hemisphere? So my, um, my PhD requires uh, data that actually is on board some spacecrafts that are um, diving in the solar wind. So I don't use telescopes um, that are based at the lab where I don't use telescopes in general. But um, so yeah, I use data from ESA's uh, Solar Orbiter mission and NASA's Parker Solar Probe mission. So they, they've been launched, I think in 2018 for Parker Solar Probe and just over two years ago. So February, 2020 for Solar Orbiter. And they, uh, yeah, they collect in-situ and remote sensing um, data. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, so you get, you get, do you get specific time for yourself to observe through those? Um, not really. They, ju they just collect data and then I can access the data. That access the data. And do you want to tell us a little bit about, I don't want to get to where, you know, we're um, halfway through now and, and we're nearing the end of some of the planned questions, but maybe tell us a little bit more. I mean, I know you also have come from lots of different places and you say, um, you want to work at NASA or ESA, and not many people, I don't know how many people have that opportunity to be able to, to have the choices. Some people, you know, I, th I think you do, if you're, do you plan on being part of a science team? What do you think, um, you know, you, you might take you in that direction? Um, I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> 
but you know you want to, you have that interest in working at NASA or a future science mission. Yeah, I know I want to be part of, of a team because I just find it so much better to work in big diverse groups. And I feel like at ESA and NASA, you've got people coming from lots of different disciplines and also like very different countries. Uh, and I guess because I went to an international school, I kind of grew up in that kind of environment with people coming from those different places. Um, and then in Manchester, it was quite an international university as well. So um, I and UCL as well. So I kind of had this all my life and it's something that's quite important um, for me. I don't see myself working either alone or in a very, um, in a team made up of people who only do the same thing. Like, I feel like you benefit a lot from diversity. So hopefully working in the space um, industry will be the same. Absolutely. I think collaboration is really important. Uh, someone coming from the United States, and I always feel very insular. And now that I live in the UK, um, much more connected to Europe and um, um, love more collaboration amongst all the space agencies and, and future missions. Um, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background, which seems also very diverse? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Um, my dad is Greek, Cypriot and Polish, and he was born in Lebanon and my mom is uh, Lebanese and they, they moved to France. So I was born and raised there. So I guess it's very, very multicultural background. And then I moved to the UK for my studies and they've been living here for about six years. So big mix of lots of countries, I guess. So that's what well, I think what I'd like you to share now. Um, is kind of outside of those questions, basically your story. Um, and the, you titled you know, your story about wearing physics glasses, a fun way of understanding the world through problem solving. Maybe share more about that. Um, so yeah, I guess since that physics teacher um, made me realize that physics was all around us, I've just been looking at the world in a different way. And um, so yeah, every time I see something, I kind of link it to a branch of physics uh, and I always find it super interesting that there is an equation or there is some kind of theorem that will explain what happens around us um, so I don't know if you like you know are cooking then you know that's thermodynamics and if you are watching tv then that's optics <laughs> and then um, I don't know if you go bungee jumping then you know gravity and like normal dynamics and if you're sailing, then it's all fluid dynamics and all of these things, they're just all around us and we don't necessarily like notice it. So just changing my, the way to view the world. And yeah, like I guess lots of people think physics is super difficult and like not very, it's not something for everyone. And I feel like that's not true. Like once you start realizing that it's all around you and it explains everything around you and you can solve problems through it, then I think it becomes more accessible to everyone. Yeah, even something as simple I used to tell my students, like even just sitting, like the forces of, atom of atoms, you know, pushing against your body to support you. That's why you don't fall through your seat. I, I agree with you. It's absolutely everywhere. And I don't think people realize that. And, and yeah, absolutely talking about, you know, chemistry and cooking and you bring up, um, you know, uh, thermodynamics is fantastic, of course, because you're making that connection to, to physics, which is Absolutely wonderful. I would even love to to work with you more um, in the future for to kind of think of the, those things um, uh, as far as like lesson plans. And I'm sure like Institute of Physics, do you work with them to do any? Um, no, I don't, but I would love to. Like, I mean, any opportunity to like do some outreach or like, you know, um, get more people interested in, in science and physics, especially young girls, um, that would be, that would be great. Absolutely. And that's why we're having this chat for the IAU's uh, celebration. I think it was the 11th of February last Friday, which was the uh, official day. Shouldn't be just a day, right? Mm -hmm. Camille, it should be all year, every day. Uh, but the official day of the international celebration of women and girls in science and the IAU is doing astronomy. And that was sort of the impetus for the RAS to do a celebration all week. And it was so wonderful today. We're starting on Valentine's Day um, with you <laughs> to, um, to do this. So is there anything else you'd, you'd like to share about you know, physics, wearing physics and glasses or what you, what you do or anything else that we've missed? Um, just that I guess I never thought I would do a PhD. Like when I started my undergrad, I, I don't know, I guess um, first year was fun. Second year was a bit less fun. I guess everyone in their second year has a bit like, that has doubts about what they're, what they're studying and if it, 
it's what they want to pursue. And I was on the four years course and I wanted to switch back to the three year course and just graduate. And then I kind of pushed through um, and then it became more and more interesting. It's just, um, I had this moment where I was like, okay, I'm just going to leave science and go work in finance. And then I went back to deciding to actually do a PhD. So uh, it was that, but it's quite funny because I really never thought I'd do that. And um, there's this little anecdote. Uh, we found it funny with my parents. It's because um, in the third lockdown, I was just cleaning my room and I came across this little paper where I had drawn like the entire solar system and things like that. And it was basically there was a solar eclipse in 2005. So I was seven um, and I had written that I loved space uh, and I loved like um, the sun. And my dream was to work in a lab or in an observatory. And I completely forgot about this. Like I had no idea that this had happened. I didn't even remember the solar eclipse. And then I found this paper a year ago and I was like, this is so funny. I'm literally doing a PhD about the sun right now. And this is like, yeah, 17 years later. <laughs> so um, I guess part of me knew when I was seven, but I just forgot about it. So yeah. That is, it makes me kind of want to do this like right here. It's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so sweet because you were seven your parents worked so hard it seems to get you interested in in physics but yet I think there were things that they must have done I, to... I just had plenty of books about space I guess <laughs> but you know and 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 now you use data that comes from space and I'm 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 sure in the future you're going to be working part of an exciting science team um and, and what you know you mentioned two uh missions to the sun currently do you do you have you heard of what are any other possible missions going to the sun or in the future um so actually isa um like said a few years a few years a few days ago they released the name of a new mission that is going to be called vigil and it will be uh stationed on like around the sun between halfway between earth and the sun um and it will also be measuring um solar related events to kind of understand more um, how they relate to space weather and how um, basically what happens around the sun. So it's like solar orbiter's little brother, I guess, a little sibling. And yeah, it's super exciting to be in the field right now when all these things are happening. It's, um, I, I had no idea actually that the field was, you know, developing so much um, right now when I decided to join. And yeah, I guess it's, it's great to be part of all of this. So also another question outside of kind of what I've prompted you, but now that you're talking about this, what do you, what do you have in the hopes for, you know, why do you do what you do? Why are you so interested in solar uh, physics or plasma physics? What do you hope you're, the science that you want to be a part of will do for you know, the world or science? So I guess before when I was studying astrophysics, it was all about, you know, very distant um, objects like galaxies and black holes and pulsars. I did my master's project on pulsars um, and it was really interesting, but there's these things are so far away that you don't see day to day applications to the science that you do. Um, and I wanted to do something a bit more concrete. I wanted to, you know, be able to see that the results that I was finding or the field I was in would, you know, have um, positive effects or like benefit the, the society we're in. And I guess what I work on um, helps explain like phenomena like space weather and these things affect us directly because if you have a very, very strong um, solar storm or geomagnetic storm, then it can affect the magnetic field of the earth and it can disrupt communications. And we live in a world that's completely like interconnected and we require electricity and we require all these things. So if um, such event was to happen, such an event was to happen, sorry, um, then I guess, the world would be paralyzed. <laughs> so, I mean, it sounds a bit dramatic, but it kind of is true. Um, so yeah, being able to understand um, like interactions between the electrons and the plasma and how these translate into um, things further down the line that can affect us, I think that's quite interesting because um, it's something that's, it's a big science question right now. And something that kind of needs to be answered quite quickly. I guess um, last week, a few of the Starlink's uh, satellites got destroyed or at least greatly affected by um, by a solar storm. And so, yeah, that's one of the, the things I'm kind of working on understanding these things so that um, these destructions don't really happen. So I see I see the results and I see why, I guess, how, how do I formulate this? There is, there is a purpose to what I do. Um, and yeah, that's kind of 
what I wanted my research to, to be. Well, I mean, climate change, I imagine, you know, uh, is going to be, I mean, is a part of our present life on earth and definitely going to be part of our future. And hopefully we're trying to um, mitigate, uh, you know, a severe impactful way. Um, I'm not sure how much we can do, but uh, yeah. So it'd be really interesting. Um, and I feel very confident you being a part of that uh, <laughs> future. Do you think you'll be working in climate science now? Mm, um, I mean, maybe, I guess I keep all the opportunities um, open. I'm not sure if I want to like stay in solar and plasma physics and actually continue exactly down that line. I could always go to climate physics. I did take a meteorology um, class in uh, during my undergrad, which was super interesting. So, I mean, why not? You mentioned that, um, yeah, it's a, you know, I think absolutely, you know, you're learning some incredible skills now and that you could definitely take a different path as you go forward. So I appreciate that you're staying. And I really don't know yet in the future. You still have, a, you know, a few, you want to finish this first, sort of take it day by day, perhaps. And there's always new missions and things popping up. And I know, I know you mentioned a bit about um, you didn't plan, you, you know, that you would be doing this. Is there anything more you want to say on that on, because there is a question here, is it what you thought or planned you would be doing? Uh, it's not really what I thought. And I guess, you don't need to like set a definite path for what you're going to do. Like things, you know, things happen and you'll meet people who will make your path change or like your interests change or, um, and I guess, yeah, like, I mean, if there is something that you definitely want to do, you can choose to follow that path like very methodically, but um, it's, it's totally okay to, to change um, like, I don't know, interests along the way. And it's never completely set and you can always you know, decide to study something else or decide to to work in a different field. Um, and again, I guess it's also super exciting to to have new opportunities that you didn't expect um, you would have. So not to stress out too much about all these things. I, I love that. Definitely not to stress out too much about all those things or, um, you know, seeing seeing this this path that you want to take as a young person. And, and if it doesn't turn out that way, it doesn't mean all those lost or matter of fact, Kind of even more exciting or amazing things um, might uh, you know be part of what you do um, and being open to new things is so important I think that's really fantastic for you so um, you know we still have about three minutes I have there's no questions that come in so I thought I'd just ask any of the attendees and we're not doing the chat on uh, YouTube so we don't have it open but I wonder if anyone if the attendees have any questions we have just a couple of minutes and um, I have the, the last question for you, which is, which I just thought I'd just hold out to see if anyone who's uh, joined us on Zoom have any questions for Camille about her, uh, her current path as a PhD or any advice, because I see there's some uh, other amazing and aspiring uh, you know, RAS fellows uh, that have attended here in Zoom uh, to see what this is all about. And, uh, and also, um, so yeah, if you have anything you want to share with Camille, now is the time to do it. But uh, Camille, I guess our last question if, uh, for you would be, you know, what advice do you have? Do you have any inspiring uh, words or suggestions for young girls? You know, you mentioned about just keeping, keeping it open. Um, and, uh, but what about young girls who are excited about science or other, other young girls whose parents are trying really hard <laughs> to just, the, you know what? I, I think as a parent, that is, that is lovely. Uh, however, I also think it's whatever your child, like you said, you said you took such a securitous path to get to where you are. Uh, I just think it's so important to support a child no matter what they're doing at any age or stage of their life. Cause I agree, it changes. And I mean, I, I grew up with a father who was in engineering at NASA and Lockheed. And he always used to tell me I'd be an engineer, um, which I, I, but I told him I just wanted to be happy and enjoy what I do. Uh, and that led me to geology. Plus, I also switched over to a, a degree in art and design because I really love art and science together. So I combine those two in what I do and what I'm doing now. Um, and I, I agree with you. There's no like one right path. But any last inspiring words or advice you might have? Um, so I guess if people tell you that because you're a girl, you shouldn't do maths or you shouldn't do science because it's going to be too difficult. You're not smart enough. Just don't listen to them at all. And I guess... In science, you probably will have to put on like a lot of work 
um, at school, but you know, kind of push through. And like, if you like those modules, keep on taking them. Don't really give up because it's quite rewarding afterwards. And if it's something you like, then you know, you should pursue that. Because I guess a lot of things that I did here sometimes were like, oh, but you're a girl. Like, and you kind of have these things where there's a lot more guys who take um, physics, for example, at uni. So for us, there was only 26% girls in my first year. And then this number kept, you know, dropping. Um, but yeah, just if you're there, if you made it there, then like you, you're in the right place. Like you, they're not going to give you the place if you're not worth it. So, you know, just that. I love that you said that because I admittedly, and I don't think I've shared this with many people. I had the, I had an experience, uh, when I was in my department, uh, for geology, where just a cohort, a colleague who was male just said to me, you don't belong here. You're not doing it. And I don't know why there's no reason I, you know, and why sometimes people do that or, or need to do that. Just focus on your own things. Keep your, you know, your, your future in mind or your path in mind that you're doing and stick to it. And um, everybody needs help, you know, do whatever it is you need to do to get through things and don't listen. I totally agree with you there. And um, it's an unfortunate thing that people feel the need to do that. And uh, definitely it happens a lot. It sounds like. Yeah. Quite, quite a bit. Like we did, um, I did talk about it with, so I, I lived with um, girls who were also studying physics with me and all of us had had experiences where um, this had happened. And I feel like it doesn't happen to guys at all. Or like no one will kind of tell them that they're not smart enough to do physics. They'll be like, oh yeah, of course, like go study that. Um, so yeah, just believing that you are smart enough because the guys are not smarter. <laughs> they're just yeah. the same, we're all human. Uh, we're all equally smart, so. Yeah, and, and and like to say that that I've never really talked about it. And I wonder how many other females are out there not mentioning it. And I, I'm not sure why. I don't know if I felt ashamed about it or anything. And I just don't share it. And I wonder if we did a survey of how many females in the science departments had this experience, how many, you know, the majority, I imagine. Uh, but that would be really interesting to know. And we're going a little long. I have a couple of questions from our attendees. Do you mind if I, yeah, sure, I sure. ask him? Uh, so, so Maria, thank you for joining us. She's uh, wanting to know if Camille could explain a bit more about what is her current research about plasmas or one of her findings of the behavior of electrons in plasmas that you'd like to share. Um, or she rephrases it to say, uh, what is one of her most interesting findings or what she has learned so far in her PhD that amazed her or things that is really cool to know? Um, so my research is about uh, electron beams that are emitted and accelerated by the sun. And so they travel from the sun all the way through the solar system. And so they will go through the solar wind, the solar corona. And the solar wind and the solar corona and most of the interplanetary medium is made up of matter that's in the state of plasma. So when the beam travels through the plasma, it will interact with it. Um, it will resonantly interact with it, so it will feed energy to the plasma. And so this makes a lot of different types of waves grow. Um, and I study the beam plasma interactions and most specifically how it grows Langmuir waves. So these waves are the oscillations in the electron density of the plasma. Um, and so that's quite interesting. I really like it. I've been doing simulations of the interactions so far, and I'll be starting to use the like actual uh, data in about three weeks. And I guess the most rewarding bit when, is when you get correct plots from uh, your simulations. And this finally happened two, three weeks ago. Um, so yeah, like for the first year and a bit of the PhD, I wasn't getting very conclusive results or anything major. And then it finally happened. Um, so that was like the most rewarding bit uh, so far. And I really enjoyed it. And I guess also I emailed uh, my supervisors all the different plots that I had. And one of them got back to me saying that the results were amazing. And so that was, you know, that was really great. Um, and I am writing all this up in a paper that I should be submitting quite soon. So I guess when it's out, you can read it. <laughs> I, I don't know how much I'm allowed to like, you know, say about all these results, but um, yeah, I'm working specifically on, all I can say is I'm working specifically on the maximum velocity of electrons that can still grow those Langmuir waves um, at different distances from the sun. Excellent, excellent question, Maria. Thank you for that submission. I'm gonna add it. Uh, and I'm sorry we didn't, I assumed we would get to that in this talk. And so make sure that for the future talks, we'll be doing that. But thank you, Camille, 
for one, being here, two, doing what you're doing, and three, sharing it with the rest of us. Um, so I really appreciate that. Uh, and I appreciate your time. And um, I think you're going to, I think you're great. And you're going to have, you have a very promising future. Um, anything, any last words you might want to say before we sign off? Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me today. And um, yeah, I guess when I was uh, a kid, there weren't that many females I could look up to in, in science or in astronomy or astrophysics. I guess there are a lot now. We talk more about them. It's just they were never really mentioned. So yeah, I hope that um, that changes in the future and you know, more little girls can look up to women in science and be like, okay, I can do that. A absolutely. And one thing I don't know that I did mention earlier, we do have all those other talks on YouTube. The RAS also just put out their 200, uh, their 200 year timeline. And uh, I worked really hard to make sure not it had astrophysics, geophysics, but also diversity and women in there. So it does, we made sure that there were stories in there about the history of, especially of women who were behind the scenes and didn't get acknowledged at the time for all the work that they contributed to science and, and uh, forwarding of astronomy. So abs absolutely, it was sort of, I want us to be more seen. And I think that was the reason for these talks, but thank you so much for um, being here with us and getting our first one started. And, uh, and um, I'm just going to uh, sign off now and let, let you know, and thank you so much. Um, and also to let you know that uh, we are gonna continue this for the rest of the week. Camille was our first one. Thank you so much for being with us. And then tomorrow we will have um, a woman RAS fellow, Dr. Ritika Josh Joshi. So hopefully I pronounced that right. And Joy, she'll be joining us. I think she's joining us from India, um, who has traveled quite a lot on her astronomy path and we'll hear more about her tomorrow. So thank you very much everyone for joining us. 